you please open your Bibles to Exodus chapter 18? Exodus 18, and we're going to continue our series. We've been studying in the book of Exodus, deliverance. God uh, delivering the Hebrews out of slavery there, but also he had to deliver them from themselves and their own tendencies towards sin. And we've discovered uh, God writing deliverance stories even today. And so um, when it comes to talking about baseball, everybody understands what the dugout is for. The players and the coaches assemble there and they take the field at the appropriate time. Even the name is obvious, dugout. Clearly, they've dug down below the playing surface and when players go to the dugout, they can step down a couple of levels. And that allows the people behind them in the grandstands to get a better view of the field. Now, most ball fields I played on, uh, the dugout was level with the ground because there were no grandstands behind them and it was far less expensive to do that. Gr- dugouts are always found on uh, the first base side and third base side. There's one ball field in the country that I learned about has both dugouts on the first base side. It's a historic uh, minor league ballpark in Rhode Island. And uh, both on, I couldn't even get a good picture of it to show you uh, both of them on the same side. Dugouts are a place of enthusiasm and camaraderie. And you can picture the uh, player that scores a run or hits the home run. He comes back to the dugout and everybody's high-fiving him and they're glad to see him. And it can also be a a place of disappointment. Picture the player that struck out with the bases loaded and he comes back to the dugout and nobody's talking to him. And I struck out when I was 11 or something in some... Bad pitch. And I was like, I'm dreading going to the dugout. And then I said to my mom, I'm not going back to that team. I'm so embarrassed. I can't go in the dugout. I don't want to face them. They're going to make fun of me. And they never said another word about it. But we always dread uh, what's happening. And of course, she didn't let me quit. You get back in there and you face it. So I want you to imagine a couple of ridiculous scenarios with me for a moment. Imagine a player who takes the field all by himself, and he insists that the rest of the team remain in the dugout. Now, that seems crazy, but we can kind of picture the player running all over the field, trying to chase down every ball, and the batters are hitting it. They see where he's at, and so they hit it to the opposite field and away from him, and he's running around crazy, and he's sweating, and he thinks he's the hero, and he looks really foolish. We can also imagine a player taking the field And he encourages, he runs out there onto the field and he realizes, whoa, hey, nobody's followed me out here. And he's like, come on, everybody, let's go. And they're like, no, we're not going on the field with that guy. Are you kidding me? Um, Not only is that lone player embarrassed, but the team doesn't win. The whole team uh, loses. Now, both those situations are ridiculous and they would never happen, right? Except they often do. In Exodus chapter 18, where we're at, Um, it happens. Moses is the lone ball player and they either won't take the field or he won't let them take the field. And so his leadership productivity suffers in the process. And so we called the message today, why leaders crack up. And we hear of leaders that, that burn out and they fall apart and they run out of steam. Why does that happen? And we're going to learn here a little bit from Moses Example, But the bottom line today is that life is no fun when you're still in the dugout. Life is not any fun when you're just sitting on the bench. It's fun to be in the game. That's what we were made to do. Now, let's look at in chapter 18. Moses gets some advice from his father-in-law. And much as we have generations here together that have assembled for our baby dedication, Moses reunites with his father-in-law, his wife, and his children. They've made their way out of Exodus. They've crossed the Red Sea. Uh, Last week, we learned that God provided water out of a rock. It was two weeks ago. We learned God provided manna uh, from heaven. And they meet up with Jethro, Moses' father-in-law. And it's in the first several verses, we won't take time to read there today, that Moses has this great reunion. He passes on to Jethro all that God has done over the last couple of months. His power in the uh, plagues, his power to divide the sea. 
and they come together. Well, then we come down to verse 13 and take a look what it says there. And so it was the next day, this is right after their reunion, Moses sat to judge the people and the people stood before Moses from morning until evening. And so when Moses' father-in-law saw all that he did for the people, he said, what is this thing that you are doing for the people? And why do you alone sit? And all the people stand before you from morning till evening. And uh, look at verse 17. Moses' father-in-law said, this thing is not good. Both you and these people who are with you will surely wear yourselves out. This is too much for you. You're not able to perform it. You see, everybody would come to Moses and he was the bottleneck of it all. Moses was the one they would come to. He was their grocer. He was their banker. He was their counselor. He was their teacher. He was the one that they talked to for everything. Now, why did they put it all on Moses? Well, they had just come out of slavery. And what was Pharaoh to them? Pharaoh was their grocer, their banker, their calendar person. He was their counselor. Everything had been built around Pharaoh. So when they left, all they put it all on Moses, then put everything there. And so there's Moses. He's the guy running all over the field, chasing the balls here, chasing the balls to right field, the left field, chasing them down to foul balls out of bounds. He's running around everywhere on the field. And nobody could survive this. This was unsustainable. And Jethro says to him, Moses, you're going to wear out. You can't keep this up. The needs are too great. And he gives Moses a fact of life. That is true for us as well. You can't do everything. And you can't do it all on your own. No one has all the skills and the resources and the tricks to sustain a family and a school and a vocation and vehicles and a household and a church and a business. We don't have the capacity to meet everyone's needs and expectations. But it is nice to be needed, isn't it? I mean, there's different kinds of people when you stop and think about it. There are some people that like to be needed. And so there's some people who just try harder when they can't meet everybody's expectations. They just think, I just need to try harder at this and then I'll be more acceptable. Then people will like me. All the effort that I've put in up until now, it wasn't enough. But if I try harder, I can get this person to like me or that person to like me. Other people need to be needed. They love the feeling of others being dependent on them. And those individuals quietly elevate their own importance by their neediness. And the sin here is uh, putting themselves as an idol. I'm so important. They need me. No, they don't need you. You need to be needed. Some people are the martyr. Have you ever known anybody who is a martyr? They let you know all the great effort that they put forth to get there for Christmas dinner. And it was uphill through the snow, barefoot. And you're like, I think we all had the same weather conditions to get here. Oh, no, theirs was far worse. And everything they went through and um, and whatever the gathering, right? You hear about how tremendously their efforts were put forth. And uh, theirs were worse no matter what. And that person's got an obsession with themselves and uh, they often are lying to themselves about their situation and their circumstances and such. And we need to repent of that sin of saying, you stay on the bench, I'll just take care of it all myself. And so Jethro has an alternative plan. And uh, in verse 19, he says, listen now to my voice. Here's what I want to say. I'm going to give you some counsel and God will be with you. Uh, Stand before God for the people so that you can bring their difficulties to God. What he starts doing is he starts helping Moses prioritize. Now, let's stop for a minute and think, how are you going to take it when somebody starts giving you some advice that you didn't ask for and they haven't even been around to see everything you've already done? I mean, Moses could have been like, hey, Uh, Jethro, I think I got him through the plagues. Okay. I think I got him out of Egypt. I think I got him through the Red Sea. I don't think I need advice from you. 
We can learn from everybody if we listen. And Jethro didn't know any of what Moses had gone through. He didn't know any of the experiences. I mean, Moses told him, but he didn't live through it. He wasn't the one walking through on dry ground. He wasn't the one, you know, facing the water and here come the Egyptians. He wasn't the one dealing with the angry, hungry people. Moses listened to his advice. He took it and he acted on it. And there's um, some good listening for us there for sure. Um, verse 21. Moreover, you shall select from all the people able men, such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness, and place such over them to be rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, and rulers of tens. And let them judge the people at all times, that it would be uh, every great matter they'll bring to you, but every small matter they themselves shall judge. It's going to be easier for you. They'll burden with you. And if you do this, you will endure and the people will go to their place in peace. Moses, here's a sustainable plan for you. And so uh, now you would think Moses would have understood this. We skipped over in chapter 17 an experience that I want to just call your attention to for a moment for Moses. And it was a battle. The end of chapter 17, after the water that we studied last week, where God created water out of the rock. After that, um, they had a battle and Joshua gathered an army of people and they went down into the valley to fight. And Moses went up on a hill overlooking the battlefield. And God said, Moses noticed, as long as he held the rod of God up, Israel prevailed. And when his arms got tired, he dropped them down and the enemy prevailed. He put his arms back up and the Israel would prevail and his arms would get tired and the bad guys would prevail. And there were two men with him, Aaron and Hur. And what they figured out was they got a, they pulled a stone up there. They got Moses over to a stone and Aaron took one arm and Hur took the other and they held Moses arms up. And Israel prevailed in the battle and they won. Moses saw it in action. But then we come to chapter 18 and he's still, he's the lone guy on the field. I'll take care of it. I got it, you guys. And he's running around the field himself. What every good leader needs is an Aaron and a her to come alongside them and hold their arms up and do for them what they can't do themselves. I was very new at First Baptist Church And uh, 23 years ago, um, more than 23 years ago, we arrived here. And so as typical of a new pastor, a young pastor, I didn't really know all what I was doing. And so it was easy to criticize that. And there were some that took advantage of those easy target of the easy target that I was. And there was one uh, elderly couple that persisted in that. And so I went to see them to try to calm them down and um, things. And uh, so after they went on and on with the list of things that may or may not have been uh, fitting, I finally said, hey, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. I said, you guys have maybe 10 years left in life. Let me just say they weren't laughing. (laughs) And I said, at the end of 10 years, you're going to die and go meet Jesus. And you're going to stand before God. I thought I didn't have anything to lose at this point. I said, when you stand before God, he's going to ask you what you've done for the last 10 years. And you'll you can say to him, you know what, that kid came to be pastor and he had no idea what he was doing. And so I criticized him every chance I got. I picked him apart and I made sure that he knew and everybody else knew all the mistakes that he was making. And I, and we criticized him every chance we got because he was young. He didn't know what he was doing. I said, do you want to tell God that 10 years from now? Or you could say, you know what? That kid didn't know anything about what he was doing. He was young. He was new. And so I prayed for him and I went by his office and I prayed for him and I supported him and encouraged him and helped him understand the culture and the people and helped other people understand him. And I 
did that. That's what I've been doing for the last 10 years. And I said to them, you have a choice in deciding what happens over the next 10 years and what happens when you stand before God. The guy said, he is not going to say that to us. So it didn't go well. And they both died within a 10-year period. Their house was torn down. And they had to stand before God and give an account of how they treated the kid pastor that didn't know what he was doing. Everybody needs, every leader needs an Aaron and a her that'll stand by and encourage and lift them up. It's so easy to criticize. It takes far more to lift up and encourage somebody and help them overcome those mistakes and shortcomings. The fact of the matter is we can do more together. God didn't intend for any of us to be out running around by ourselves. Illustration number two from Acts chapter six. We'll not get to that, but I want to show you in Ephesians chapter four what the scripture says there. In chapter four of Ephesians, and it's in verse 11, it talks about God's giftedness to the church and how God raised up and gifted every one of us with gifts and abilities. One of the great joys of parenting is you get to discover the gifts and abilities that your child has and what their interests are. And most of our, uh, the ones we had were little babies, but the four-year-old, they said, I think it'll have something to do with trains. And so you can immediately picture, and they gave us a picture of him with his engineers playing with trains. It's a great joy to discover the interests and skills and abilities that somebody has. And God in, in Ephesians 4 and verse 11, he gave some to be apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the church leaders. Here's the role for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. It's a telescoping. The word for is because or for this purpose. So here's the church leaders for this purpose to equip the believers. And what's that about? So that believers do the work of the ministry. What's that about? So that the church body gets built up. God didn't intend for the pastor to be the one that runs around all over the field. And he didn't intend for Moses to do that. The fact is we can do more together. That we is greater than me for any one of us. And so uh, what a great lesson for parents when it comes to responsibility and teaching responsibility to kids. Age appropriate along the way. Just because you can do something doesn't mean you should. Just because you can do it for them doesn't mean you should. Because you're training them in responsibility. And when uh, eight, if we'd go back 18 years ago when it started for those you know, students that are graduating from high school. There's a process of time. And you that are are parents with kids at home, whatever stage your kids are at, there's a process of time of helping them become responsible individuals. And you're in that process. And what you might think, I'm a a loving parent, so of course I'm going to do this for them because I love them, often turns into a crippling of them when they're old enough, they should know better and should be able to do that. And so Ephesians 4 describes the roles in the church that each of us use our gifts and abilities that nobody, there's no lone wolf. There's nobody sitting in the dugout. God calls every one of us to get out into the field of play and to use our gifts and abilities and deploy them uh, in various ways. Now, let me add one final word. There's some here who have been looking to a Moses. You've been looking for a Moses. Somebody that will be my everything. Somebody that will be uh, the man of my dreams, the woman of my dreams, the, the leader that's supposed to be 
all in all and everything and be the perfect. And here's all my expectations. And uh, there's not an individual on the planet that can meet your needs the way they need to be met. And all throughout Scripture, God says things like in 1 Peter 5 and verse 7, cast all your care upon him for he's the one who cares for you. And in John 16 and verse 33, Jesus said, these things I've spoken to you that you may have peace in the world. You're going to have tribulation, but I have overcome the world. Jesus is the one with that capacity. There is only one person who has the capacity to do it all. And some wives are holding their husbands to such a standard they can't possibly ever meet. And they're expecting that husband to meet their needs they can't possibly ever meet. And some uh, husbands are expecting their wives to be all that and everything. And they, the wife can't possibly be everything. There's not a man or woman alive on the planet that can be everything you need them to be. And we need to stop expecting other people to be who only God can be. In 1 John chapter 5 and verse 4 and 5, it teaches us again that the victory comes from Christ. Whoever's born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, our faith. Who's he who overcomes the world? But he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. He's the only one. So we find our identity in Christ and he values you and sees you worth fighting for. We deploy our gifts and resources for God's work. We get out of the dugout and onto the field. Because we is greater than me. And so we have a say yes board on the back there that has opportunities for you to make a significant contribution with your life and the lives of young people. We have openings in our cleaning crew where somebody can use their gifts in a behind the scenes kind of way. And help keep this facility looking new. The V Medical Clinic in Pittsburgh, that pregnancy center, has need of men that will counsel the young fathers. Dozens have just completed a ministry season through our Wednesday night ministries. Where are you? In the dugout? Or on the field? And Christ left the dugout of heaven, the comfort there, to... Come to earth. We can't possibly ever pay him back, but out of gratitude, he calls us to serve. And out of stewardship, he calls us to a place of serving. And that's the calling he gives to us and the lesson from Moses. Not an individual running all over the field, but together we can do more. Would you bow your heads with me, please? Heavenly Father, I pray for families here that are in the process of teaching their young people responsibility and preparing them for adulthood, preparing them for that age 18 release. We hear a baby crying across the room and we thank you so much for new life that was so beautifully represented to us this morning. The need of raising the next generation in faith. The stakes couldn't be higher, God. It calls for every one of us to get out of the dugout and to get in the game. I I pray for an empty dugout and a field full of players available, willing to be used by you. In Jesus' name, amen.